This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Brian Beck Jensen, Joe Monty, and Joshua G. Rosenblum, who all just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 483 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the new movie, The Green Knight, directed by David Lowry. And this will include spoilers for everything in the movie, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Erin Lindsay, making her 32nd appearance on the show. She's the author of the Bloodbound series of epic fantasy novels, and the Nicholas Lenoir series of paranormal detective novels, which she writes under the name E.L. Tetensor. The Silver Shooter, the latest novel in her Rose Gallagher series of historical mysteries, is out now. So, Erin, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. The next up, we've got Christopher M. Savasco, making his 13th appearance on the show. His novel, Beheld, will be published by Lethe Press in April. It's a darkly twisted psychological thriller set in 11th century England, exploring the legend of Lady Godiva's naked ride through Coventry. Chris is also the former editor of Paradox Magazine, and he's written 20 Dungeons & Dragons supplements, including the best-selling Philosial's Ultimate Guide to Poison, which are available now through the DMs Guild website. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. And also joining us today is Lara Elena Donnelly, making her fourth appearance on the show. She's the author of the Amber Lowe Dossier Trilogy and Jim Henson's Labyrinth Masquerade from Boom Comics. Her short fiction has appeared in Strange Horizons, Escape Pod, and Nightmare. And her new novel, Base Notes, will be published by Thomas and Mercer in January. So, Lara, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be back. Okay, so let's start off with Aaron and have you tell us about your expectations going into The Green Knight. Um, I had high expectations just because um, I really like Dev Patel, and I also find he's got good taste in scripts. Generally, he's if he's in a project, it's it's something that um, is, is high quality, so I like that about it. I didn't know anything about the director. It's been... I'm trying to remember when I read the poem, I want to say seventh grade or eighth grade, like a long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> um, so, you know, my expectations were vague, but, but high. Um, I deliberately didn't read any of the reviews or look into it beforehand. That tends to be what I do. Um, I don't, I don't like sort of having other people's impressions formed in my head before I have a chance to have my own. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was definitely excited about the project for sure. Yeah, and I'll just explain Dev Patel. He plays Sir Gawain, the main character. So, and he's a Oscar-winning actor and been in all sorts of Slumdog Millionaire and all sorts of great stuff. And he's like ruthlessly charming. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I was really looking forward to that because, I mean, it, it's an interesting sort of vibe to to give that character. And and as it turns out, he played it completely differently than I expected him to. So that was cool as well. Mm -hmm. How about Chris? What were your expectations going into the Green Knight? Yeah, my expectations were also pretty high. I I, I kind of feel like this movie was in some ways made with someone like me as the target audience in mind. I mean, I'm sort of a Arthurian super fan, and and uh, I I actually I mean I had read the Gowan poem years ago as well. I, I actually made a point of rereading it, the the Tolkien uh, translation, just before seeing the film, so it would, so it would be more f sort of fresh in my mind, and I. Um, I, yeah, I also had high expectations based on Dev Patel, uh, also didn't know anything about the director. Um, I had seen the trailer, which looked impressive to me, but I also tried to avoid having, you know, read any uh, sort of reviews or impressions before seeing it. So I also went into it blind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess, um, you know, I guess you could say the main character's name is either Gawain or Gowan. In the movie, they actually say Gowan. Um, I always... that, was a, that was a piece of learning for me. It's been Gawain in my head from the beginning, but yeah. Or if, or if you were the king, you said Garwin. <laughs> yeah. So that wasn't just my imagination. No. 
Okay. But uh, I don't know. Does anyone have any? Should we just settle on one pronunciation now, or should we just let everyone I'll, go I'll with whatever they want? I'll probably forget even if. I have always you. said, I have always said Gavin, um, because I thought it was Gawain for a long time, and I was in a, I think it was like an English class in college, um, where I was told that it was actually pronounced Gavin or was a form of Gavin, which I guess makes sense with with Gawain. Uh, but maybe it's a free for all. Maybe we should all just pronounce it how we feel it should be pronounced in our hearts. Yeah. All right. That sounds like a good policy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm going to go with Gawain just because that's the way I always said it in my head growing up. And I, um, you know, I had this picture book uh, by Selena Hastings when I was growing up called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And it's it's a beautiful bu book. It's illustrated in the style of a uh, like an illuminated manuscript. And I just read it over and over and over again. So, uh, you know, and I've never, I don't think I've ever read the actual, uh, like middle English or whatever poem. Um, but, but I certainly knew the story really well from that. Um, and so how about Lara, what were your expectations going into Green Knight? Um, expectations. I don't know if I had any, I think I was trying to like hold myself in suspense until I saw the movie, but I will say I saw, so there were two trailers released, I think, and the first trailer was really weird and creepy and had no sense of narrative at all to it. And I was familiar with the poem, so I was like, okay, I know generally what the story is going to be about, but the trailer, the first trailer felt very atmospheric and bizarre, and so I got really excited so I guess I did have expectations, which were like, I'm excited for this movie, um, based on the teaser trailer. And then when the longer version of the trailer came out, I was almost a little disappointed because it had more, more like narrative cohesion. And I kind of just wanted to live in that weird, mysterious uh, expectation until the movie came out. But luckily, when I did finally see it, I was like, oh, this movie feels much more like the initial teaser trailer where you just are like, okay, some stuff is happening and there's not going to be a lot of explanation about it, which I actually really enjoyed. I liked, I liked just sort of living in the world of the movie as it happened without, without the movie really like telling me, and this is what's happening now. And this is why it's happening. It was a, it was a wild ride uh, while it was going on. Yeah, well, and let me just say too that my, my I had pretty high expectations because, as I said, I really liked the the Green Knight story. You know, I really like medieval fantasy, all that kind of stuff. And also, um, I thought the trailer looked pretty cool. And also, you know, this is from A twenty four studio, which is um, you know they've had a lot of really good movies that they've produced or released in the past couple of years. Ex Machina, The Witch, Hereditary. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so I was like, oh, if this is sort of on the level of those, you know, I'm, I'm really going to love this. And I was a little, I thought the trailer looked really, really cool. I was a little nervous that it seems like it was maybe like a little kind of like out there, like throwing in a little arty. Every, everything in the kitchen sink sort of. So that was my one thing that I was a little, uh, apprehensive about, but I was really, uh, really excited going into this movie. And this was also, I think the only movie I've seen in the theater, in like the last 18 months. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dave, do you know which of the two trailers it was that you saw? Uh, I assume the first one that Lara is talking one. about because yeah, it was it pretty, like it was pretty psychedelic. Yeah. It's interesting because I haven't seen either of them, but just listening to Lara talk, it makes me wonder like that almost, it sounds so much like a studio thing. Like they release the first trailer that's very much in the spirit of the film, the teaser. And then the studio is like, you're, you can't sell a movie like that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give, you have to give audiences more. There needs to be more to grip onto. Um, and I just sort of always curious about the behind the scenes stuff. You know what I kind of thought, speaking of expectations from the teaser, especially, and because A24 has put out horror movies recently i from the first trailer was like this is going to be a really creepy movie and it wasn't actually that creepy like once i saw it at the whole movie it had some moments of like ooh, but but the initial teaser trailer made it feel a little like it was going to be dark fantasy horror which i would not have been against um but that was like the mood of the trailer and and kind of the mood of the studio and it didn't end up bearing out quite as creepy well, as it seemed. But I mean, like compared to like Excalibur or the Sword oh, yeah. in the Stone. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, com yeah, compared to Sword in the Stone, definitely creepy. And Merlin was creepy. And I like me a creepy Merlin. That's my mm. favorite kind of Merlin. 
but it, and it was dark just like dark you know like just arthur's throne room you know it's like torch lit and i mean it was the movie is like dark you know just yeah. vi- you know in terms of how much light there is in the scene just pretty much throughout um okay but so so uh so lara said that she she pretty much you know watched the movie and and, and liked it uh how about chris kind of what were your initial well what was your so, initial response to the movie yeah so uh you know as i said I do think I was the target audience for this. Um, unfortunately, it just didn't work for me at all as a movie. Um, it, I think that it had some beautiful visuals and it had some really interesting set pieces and atmosphere. Um, and it threw in all sorts of Easter eggs for, you know, the the fan of Arthurian legend that I think, you know, a sort of general audience wouldn't have picked up on. I mean, there were definite sort of Easter eggs in there. But when all was said and done, I kind of felt like the movie added up to just a giant collection of Easter eggs and nothing else. I felt like there was little or no story, like even less story than there was in the original poem, and a complete absence of character development um, so that I never felt invested in any of the characters. Um which, you know, sort of became a problem because, I mean, apart from it being a problem generally, I mean, the movie is very slow paced, um, which can work. I mean, I love movies like, I loved The Witch and I love movies like that that are very atmospheric. Like there was a movie um, with Mads Mikkelsen called Valhalla Rising, which sort of had a similar vibe. And I love that generally. It just didn't hold together for me here, unfortunately. And and because I had such high expectations, it, it sort of was a bit of a letdown. Yeah. Have you seen it once, Chris, or did, have you seen it more than once? I, I did only see it once. I almost can't imagine sitting through it a second time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about Aaron? What was your initial response to the movie? Um, I liked it. I didn't love it um, for some of the same reasons that, that Chris just highlighted. I liked about it what Lara highlighted about it. So I, I really, you know, I thought the, the overall strength of it for me was that it did an amazing job of capturing the feel of those old poems. Um, and if you read something like Beowulf or you read, uh, you know, Gowan and the Green Knight, you have, it's they're disorienting. There are moments when you don't really know what's going on. They have this very ethereal feel and it's, it's like walking through a dreamscape. And I think the movie captured that beautifully. Um, I liked some of the thinking behind it, like to the extent that they were deliberately toying with the tropes around romantic chivalry, I thought was really interesting. Um, but I found it very difficult to connect with the protagonist. Um, so you know, I don't even know if we can say conclusively whether there was character development or not, because he lacks a point of attachment. And I think part of that is deliberate, particularly at the beginning. Um, and, and maybe it says a lot about modern sensibilities, but I, I definitely appreciated that the movie was deliberately disorienting. It deliberately felt like a dream or even an acid trip in some places. And I liked that about it. And I thought it was appropriate to what it was trying to capture. Could could you but, say what do you mean by he lacks a point of attachment? There, there's 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 no way that I can sort of anchor on to him and experience his journey. So it becomes very two dimensional in that sense. It's like admiring a beautiful painting, mm-hmm. but it, it lacks that third dimension where you can sort of empathize with the, the the protagonist and understand what the protagonist is going through, and therefore it lacks emotional resonance because you can't can't get that point of attachment with, with the protagonist. You can't feel what he feels because you you don't know what he feels. Yeah, I completely agree. With um, you. And, and it's just, it's so, I think it's okay to have that up to a point, but I think you need to anchor it in a couple of scenes. And I think they gestured in that direction. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but there is a scene. Well, there are a couple of scenes, one right at the beginning with King Arthur and one toward the end with his host in the castle where there's an attempt to, sort of talk to him and figure out where he's coming from. Um, and at one point, his host even mocks him and is like, you're really bad at, at answering questions. And I'm like, yeah, he is. <laughs> I love that line <laughs> so much. I have no idea what's going through this dude's head at any moment. And that never changes. And I wanted that to change. So I think it could have been really effective if they had broken that up with a couple of moments of, you know, sort of a <laughs> anchor points where you well, could it- touch down for just a second 
reorient yourself and then spring off into the ether again. If that it's makes funny sense. when you mention, again, without getting too far ahead, but Lord Bertillac, another quote he has is, I see things everywhere that bear no logic. Hmm. And that's kind of like, yeah, I, I, dude, I know where exactly where you're coming from. <laughs> um, but let me, let me tell you about my, my sort of arc with this movie, because as I said, I had super high expectations going in. First viewing, I was, was really exasperated with it. And, um, I, you know, I came home and I told my girl, you know, my girlfriend, Steph, she's like, how was it? And I was like, oh, it, it drove me crazy. I was like, do you know what it reminds me of? Do you remember that movie, A Ghost Story, that we watched? Um, it's like the super pretentious, um, like, ghost movie. And I was like, it reminded me so much of that. It was, like, so slow and, like, everything. And, and Steph says, so who directed it? And I was like, oh, this guy, David Lowry. I'm not sure who he is. And I look him up. He's like, oh, it's the guy who directed A Ghost Story. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. But then, like, um, then a lot of my friends were like, oh, I love this movie. And it got great. A critical response and everything and it just kind of like stayed with me and i kept thinking about it and i was like you know i bet if i were to watch this again i would like it a lot more kind of just knowing what to expect out of it mm. and so then i just watched it again last night and i was like yeah i liked it a lot more the second time i can um, see that uh i still th i mean i think that the beginning is great and i think that the ending is great and i think the middle is kind of boring and nonsensical and stuff but um but overall i'd say i, I kind of like it at this point but I feel like that mid, the middle nonsensical part, I, for a minute, initially, when I realized how little sense it was making, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, what is, like, what is the point of this part? How does it tie into the rest of the narrative? But I think when we got to the, the like, saint's cabin, I, at that point, I was like, oh, this is the middle bit of the quest where stuff just happens. You know, you go on a quest and you have an end goal, but before you can get there, like a bunch of other things happen. And I do feel like in many of these quest narratives, the things that happen in the middle don't always have anything to do with the end goal of the quest. So once I had kind of reset my expectations to be like, okay, this is going to be one of those quests where a bunch of things just happen to the hero on the way to the goal. Um, then everything that happened in the middle of the movie, I just took at face value of like, okay, this is another adventure that he's having. So, uh, yes, I, I, in terms of those middle elements of the film. So first of all, I think it's interesting that from the time that Gowan leaves, you know, whatever Camelot or the castle, uh, to the time that he arrives at the, the nobles house, the, you know, the, the, the married couple. Everything in between there is stuff that was just thrown in by the director. None of that is from the poem. So, I mean, the bandits that rob him, St. Winifred, the fox companion, the giants, all of that is just new material. And that's fine. And I'm not one of these people who is very fussy about remaining true to the material, particularly when it comes to Arthurian legend, where basically every author that's ever written Arthurian legends is always adding to it and changing it and switching which characters do what. So I'm fine with that. But the problem I have is that if you look at those elements, um, the band, it's the Winifred, the Fox, the Giants, if you remove any one or more of those from the adventure and from the journey, it wouldn't have changed the ultimate story at Tom all. Tom Bombadil. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, but it's it's like, you know, four or five different Tom Bombadils all being thrown in. And and they were interesting little, I don't know, uh, sort of episodes in their own right, I guess, in some ways, some of them more so than others. But, you know, I like none of them really helped me do what what Aaron had been talking about, like anchor on to the character or even really develop the themes further or, you know, whatever they were supposed to be doing. You know, they, they were just more sort of like, here's another little set piece that was like another painting in this art gallery of of scenes that we were watching. And so, uh, yeah, it's OK to throw in a little bit of that. But if you if the entire middle of your film, I mean, almost like 50 percent of the film is all that kind of just eh, let's just throw this in. Let's just throw this in. I'm not sure that 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 works or at least it didn't work for me. I found it more frustrating than than anything. Let me let me just set up in case anyone's listening to this without who just called. So the story of Green of, of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, basically this Green Knight comes to King Arthur's court and says, Does anyone here have the guts to exchange axe blows with me? You get to take a shot at me and then I get to take a shot at you. And Gawain is like the youngest of the knights. I mean, in this movie he's not a knight, but you know, he's he's sort of this young young guy. 
and he accepts this challenge and he chops off the Green Knight's head and the Green Knight picks up his head and says, okay, you got to come to, I came to your castle, you got to come to my castle in a year, you know, it's, it's like six days ride north of here, come find me. And then he rides off. And so then Gawain has to, a year later, he has to go knowing that he's just going to get his head chopped off. Um, Can and, I interject for one second? Yeah. You skipped. You, you you skipped, and and when I subsequently went to the reviews after the movie, they mostly pick up where you picked up, which is where the Green Knight rides into our King Arthur's uh, round table during the Christmas celebration. But to me, that skips one of the more frustrating moments, which is there's this prologue that not only sets up um, Gowan as a bit of a ne'er do well, um, but it's got his mother who. I find out in the reviews is actually Morgan Le Fay or Morgan Le Fay, or depending on, you know, which legend you read. Um, I don't think that's ever s explicitly said in the film. No. It's but not. so it's, so it's all we know is it's his mother and she performs this. And, and we know that she's a little bit frustrated with her son for being a ne'er-do-well. And she performs the ceremony of witchcraft and she's the one who summons the green knight. Um, I don't recall this from the poem and I cannot for the life of me figure out why she did it. And we can speculate about it. But that was my first point of frustration where I thought there are lots of places where I'm okay with not understanding why people do what they do. But this is a moment where I wanted to understand a little bit better why the Green Knight was summoned in the first place. Oh, yeah. see, I totally feel like I understood exactly why she did it. Okay, um, wait, let without... me, Lara, we'll get back to you in one second. Let me just finish. Okay. I'm actually just explaining the Green Knight story, not even this movie, but just like, you know, if, if you're poem? not familiar with the story oh, yeah, at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so so Gawain, he goes to get his head chopped off and he, he ends up at this castle where there's this lord and lady. And the lord says, basically, I'm going to go out hunting and each day I'll give you whatever I catch. And then you get you give me in return whatever you like catch, quote unquote. And so, um, and then the lady of the house is always trying to seduce him and each day, like she you know, gives him a kiss or something. And then he, when the Lord gets back, you know, he's like, oh, I got this boar or whatever. And Gawain's like, well, here, here's this kiss that I got. And so it's this like sort of weird little game that they're playing. And then ultimately the lady gives Gawain this, um, this magic green belt. And she says it'll protect him from the green knight. And so he wears it and it turns out this whole thing is a trick. And the Green Knight sort of takes a chop at him, but just sort of cuts the side of his neck and says, you know, if you hadn't taken the belt, I would have missed you entirely. But I had to sort of teach you a lesson for taking a belt because you most but because you mostly didn't uh, shack up with my wife, uh, you know, I'm, I'm letting you live. And it turns out that this Lord is really the Green Knight is really this Lord. And this has all been this plot by Morgan Le Fay to kind of like test King Arthur's knights and see how well behaved they are something, something like that. I read the kid's book when I was <laughs> a long time ago, but uh, is that, I don't know, does that sound pretty much right to everyone? Is that pretty much the story? In I'm not, sure that, yep, I'm not yep. sure that the Lord and the Green Knight are the same person in the poem, but... I, I can't are. remember I if he wears the green belt or if he doesn't wear it, but the punishment is that he lied about receiving yes. it. Yes, yes. Yeah, he doesn't wear the green belt when he actually goes to get his head chopped off because he's like, that would be cheating, but nor does he give the belt to Bertilak after the wife gives it to him. I think, um, again, no, 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 I, I read think, this I think, when I was like... Yeah, no, I think he was wearing it, but it was just the fact that he didn't let the knight know he had it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the picture book version I read, Lord Bertilak was definitely the green knight and Gawain definitely wore the green sash. I don't know if it might have been changed from the poem. I'm not sure. That's my remembrance of the poem as well. But yeah, yeah. can't confirm. Okay, cool. So, so that's basically the story... And so then, Lara, uh, you were going to say about, in response to Aaron's thing about Morgan Le Fay? Oh, that I felt like I didn't need more explanation about why she summoned the Green Knight, because she seemed so bent on, like, my ne'er-do-well son, I need to help him get ahead at court, so I'm going to, like, the whole thing in this version was Morgan Le Fay was not plotting to test the knights of King Arthur's court as a whole, that she was like, Ugh, my son is never going to get ahead at court unless I give him an opportunity. So that was what she was doing with summoning the Green Knight. Um, and also, I feel like I didn't need more to connect to Gavin. I was just like, yeah, he he's this ne'er do well who's real. He also wants to do better. Um, I, I I don't feel like I needed more explicit character development from the text i I've, i did not have a hard time reading into 
these characters like any of their yeah. motivation yeah I'll, I'll say i found gawain pretty relatable like he doesn't want to get his head chopped off i mean the, all the setup stuff at the beginning worked worked for me just fine but but so, so lara so 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 morgan's plot is gawain the, this green knight's going to come in gawain's going to chop his head off gawain's going to go off on this quest he's going to be protected by the green belt and nothing's going to happen bad's going to happen to him he's going to come back and everyone's going to be like oh he was so brave to do all this stuff he'd make a great king right that's that's her plot basically yeah she's like i'm gonna make it look like he does something really cool but he'll never actually be in real danger um and and then he sort of at the end oh oh no we're skipping way ahead to the end at the end when he (laughs) okay well when when we get there uh i will i will I will address yeah. this. But basically my my interpretation of this is that his mom is like, oh my God, he's never going to have an opportunity to prove himself. And I want him to have that, but I don't actually ever want him to be in danger. So I'm going to set up this crazy situation where he looks like he's committed a heroic act, but he'll be safe because I can keep him safe from my own creations. So so that's uh, that's an interpretation. And I totally understand why you would have that interpretation. And to the extent that I, you know, sort of injected my own interpretation into it's quite different. And I think those differences are fundamental to how you process everything that comes next. So this is one example where, like I said, I I don't think it's always necessary to understand character motivations, and they don't even always need to make sense because human beings don't always make sense. Um, But this is one where I think it so fundamentally changes how you metabolize everything that follows that I I would have liked a little more. And so for me, she's not trying to help her son get ahead at court at all. It's nothing as cynical as that. She wants him to become a man and to be, to become, uh, a, to, to mature and to do the right thing and to learn and to go through this difficult journey so that he can understand his place in the world. And, you know, sort of, and, and maybe I'm reading into that because it, it jives a little bit more with the overall idea of, you know, the, 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 the ethos, the, the chivalric code and all of the rest of it. Um, and, you know, after she casts the spell, she swoons. And I found myself wondering, did she swoon because she's tired from casting the spell or because she swoons right after he chops off the knight's head? And a critical part of this, um, and where I, again, would have liked to understand a little better. So the knight comes in and he makes it very clear that whatever blow you deal to me, be it a nick or a death blow will be revisited upon you. And so, so, so King Arthur has this great line where he, or, or is it, or is it Guinevere? One of the two of them says to him, you know, Gowan, you do understand this challenge, right? You understand the nature of the game. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I got this. And the, the green knight kneels and bears his neck. So my first issue is there, and this is an issue from the poem. There's absolutely nothing heroic about lopping the head off a guy who offers you his neck. And two, all you had to do was nick him with your blade. Ha ha, game over. Um, so, but he doesn't do that. He cuts off the head, knowing that this will mean that he, you know, gets a fatal blow. So he celebrates, you know, like uh, mixed martial arts style, <laughs> that, that he's won this wonderful battle where he chopped off the head of a guy on his knees with his head bowed. Um, so that kind of really, to me, upends the idea of of honor and chivalry in the first instance. And then the moment he does that, Morgan Le Fay, we cut to her swooning. And I thought, again, is she swooning because she expended her magic on this spell or is she swooning because she's like, oh, my God, he fucked it up. <laughs> like he's now in mortal danger, whereas he didn't have to be if he hadn't been so eager to prove his mettle. But, By but if, he had just nicked, if he had just nicked the Green Knight's neck, then it wouldn't be that much of an accomplishment to just go a year later and have his neck nicked in return, right? Well, so it's it's not much of an accomplishment either to, to chop off the head of someone who volunteers his head. So, you know, either the, the front end of the quest puts you in a, in a bit of a dubious light or the back end of the quest puts you in a bit of a dubious light. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I want, I want to get Chris back in here. Chris, what do you think well, about all this? Yeah, I mean, I think I think all of these interpretations are as valid as any other, and I think that's part of the problem. I, I mean, mean. It, it it's nice to have a, a story that can be interpreted in different ways, but at the same time, because we're only you know these explanations are only true to the extent that we are layering them onto the film. Like, I don't think the film actually presents those interpretations. We're we're kind of using our outside understanding of the Arthurian myths to do this. Um, And so like in the poem, 
uh, uh, Gowan finds out from the Green Knight at the end, after the, the final exchange of blows, the Green Knight says, yes, well, I was created by a curse that was put upon me by Morgan Le Fay, and she was the one who sent me to Arthur's court. And in the poem, the motivation is she thought that the the terror of seeing a, a, a lopped off head speaking and this, the whole sort of tableau would frighten Guinevere to death and would end up killing her and would also disrupt and test the you know whether or not this so called noble uh, knights of the Round Table were as vaunt noble as they as they were you know everyone thought they were by throwing this sort of weird monkey wrench into the into the mix and and making someone have to take up this impossible quest. So you don't find that out until the end in the poem. Here, I, I agree. I think we're supposed to assume that this is Morgan in the beginning, um, which is interesting because in the poem, also, Morgan is not his mother, nor is she in most of the Arthurian myths. It's Morgaus, who is sort of half-sister to, to Morgan. Um, but here, I guess they decided to make Morgan his mother in the in the film for, I don't know, I'm not sure why, I guess just to kind of decomplicate the narrative or something. But but the problem I have with that is so my the the interpretation that I laid onto it in terms of her motivation was that she was doing this as a way to angle to getting her son viewed as the, as the likely heir because she and Merlin wanted to kind of bring back the kind of old faith and the druidic faith instead and push out the Christians like the like Guinevere and all and and that faith. And that's why sort of at the end, without giving away the, the very end, um, when we have that vision of the future, it's Merlin who comes and takes, you know, the next baby that's born, the heir away, because they're, they're all sort of, it's like, aha, we're, we're in ascendance now. We're going to now be able to groom the next king even after Gowan. And it's like they've basically co-opted the, the, the court. So... If that was their motivation, a sort of coup, basically, against the prevailing sort of Christian ruling class, then I, I, I don't understand, like, why, again, she, I think the, a fair interpretation of all the sort of trials and travails that he has along the way is that they're all basically Morgan or Merlin manifesting, because Otherwise, how does he always, you know, he ends up getting the, the belt back, even though he lost it. His horse comes back, even though it was taken by the bandits. It's all because this is all part of this big thing that they're creating. But then it's just like, well, why are they throwing obstacles in his path? Why are they giving him things back? I don't know. I mean, I don't have any answers. I don't know that there are any answers. And it may be that my interpretation is not the interpretation the director had. Maybe none yeah. of our interpretations are. We just well, We just don't know. And so that's... That's a problem. I well, yeah, let, let me say, I, I agree with you that because when I was just reading people's responses to the movie, there was essentially no overlap in terms of what anyone thought was going on in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that I think that I agree with you that I think that's a problem. I think it's like good to have a certain amount of ambiguity, but I think there's just certain facts in terms of like basic character motivations and things that, that everyone know. should pretty much be able to agree, agree yeah. on. I, I feel like if this guy made a movie that so many people have enjoyed watching, and even if they think that it's that it's about totally different things, I don't know if it's a failure. Like maybe I think it would be a failure if there was obvious intent and people were not grasping it. But to me, so much of this movie is just like a weird thing is happening now, and it is obviously like poignant with significance and you can read in whatever you feel needs to be read into it mm -hmm. uh i i don't think it's like a total failure of the film that it that it doesn't have an obvious um like cohesive narrative i i think if people are reading into the film whatever they want to read into it it's a piece of art that is providing them an opportunity even if people are taking that opportunity very differently. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Um, but, but you know, again, I, I don't think, I mean, I'm not saying, and, and I'm not hearing anyone here say that that it's a failure. Um, it's a question for me of degree rather than kind. 
So like I said, I absolutely appreciate that sense of disorientation. I appreciate the ambiguity of it um, and th that it is challenging and that people have different interpretations. I think these are all strengths, um, but I think it's just taken too far. And I would have liked to see, like I said, a couple of linchpin anchor points so that we all start, we, we should all start the race from the same starting point. Um, and if you don't, and the starting point for me is understanding why the Green Knight is in that room in the first place. So what was the plan? Did the plan go the way it was supposed to? Did the plan not go the way it was supposed to? Is this a redemptive journey? Is this um, Gowan exceeding his mother's expectations? She sets up a, a specific obstacle course, and although he, he stumbles at the first hurdle, he then finds his way to do something better than she imagined. Um, and I do my, my own preference anyway, um, is, is certainly to have a sense of orientation at the beginning. Um, and so that that disorientation that you have later on almost feels more satisfying because, because you started, everybody started with the same building blocks to completely mix a metaphor. I, 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 I would agree with that, but I, I do also agree with what Lara was saying that I, I don't think that the movie, to the extent that it, fails on various levels, I don't think it fails because of the ambiguity. And I agree that it can be a, a wonderful experience to watch something that everyone can interpret differently and, and in their own unique way. I think that's that's a, a really great way to make a film as well. But I think one thing that we should realize here is like all of our, at least the three of our or four of our interpretations that we've been talking about here, all sort of depend on outside knowledge of the Arthurian legends that we're bringing to the table. I mean, even to the extent that we are recognizing this character as Morgan. I mean, because as someone mentioned, they never tell you in the movie that that's Morgan. We're just assuming that that is because we know who Morgan Le Fay is. So someone who's watching this movie who doesn't know anything about the Arthurian legends, I feel like they wouldn't even have... I don't know how they, I, it would be interesting. Like if someone went into this having like, Arthur, who's that? You know, like what, <laughs> how, how, how they would interpret this film. Because I think if you take away the, the knowledge that we bring to the table, I, I don't know how you would make sense of most of what's going on. I don't even think that's true entirely though, because I, like I am familiar with, with the story, though it has been many years since I read any iteration of it, but like, I did not immediately identify his mother as Morgan Le Fay. I was like, okay, his mother is a witch, right? His mother is a witch. And I think even if you didn't know it was an Arthurian legend, nothing in the film relies necessarily on the viewer knowing Arthurian legend. All you have to know is it's old times, and there's a king and queen, and there's this guy who's sort of a wastrel and and then this adventure happens i don't think yeah. that it that it really relies on viewer knowledge of arthurian legends like there's nothing well, that you're not going to understand i, I agree I with think. that because you know that that his mom's a witch and that she's the king's sister and even if you yeah, don't know yeah. that her name is morgan or whatever i mean i, I agree I, it's I, not it's not fundamental yeah let me I'm, I'm curious though larry do you think that this movie is like perfect or is there anything that you would want to see changed about it? I don't know if I think it's perfect. Um, I I often find that I consume media not uncritically, but I rarely find myself leaving a movie with strong feelings that it should have done something differently. I, I feel like I often leave and I'm like, okay, that was a complete work of, of fiction. I'm going to think about different parts of it. There are some things that I definitely like watch or read and I'm like, oh my God, what a huge mistake the creator made here or here. Uh, and if they had done something differently, it could have been a, a much stronger story. But this one I think was so, um, so aesthetic and so dreamlike that I just took it really at face value. Um, and I wasn't trying to sort of say like, how could this have been a stronger film because, or how could it have made more sense or how could it have told its story better? Because it was so formless that like when, when I walked out, I know we talked about it after we walked out of the film, but I think a lot of what we talked about was just the power of the imagery, um, and, and less like the arc or shape or structure of the story. 
Mm. Yeah, well, because it's an unbelievably visually beautiful movie. I don't know, I don't know if and, we actually said that, but I mean, yeah, it is. there's yeah, no sure. question about that. It is, and it's tremendously successful, as I said at the beginning, at creating atmosphere and mood. Tremendously successful at doing that. Um, and it does that in, in so many different ways. Um, and one of the things that I appreciated so much that really that really did feel like, like I said, like like Beowulf or or some of these older um, epic poems and 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 Arthurian legends is the sort of the fact that all of the characters take everything at face value. At no point in the whole thing is anyone like, "Whoa, what's happening here?" They're just like, hmm. "Oh, there's a green knight. His head. He's talking with a chopped off head. That's okay." You know, he comes across these. These uh, these giants wandering in super slow mo through through a mountain valley, and and he's like, can I can I hitch a ride with you guys? The fox starts talking to him, and he starts talking back like like it's nothing at all. I I really I really liked that sort of casual acceptance of of the uncanny and of the fae. I I you know that they they are they're overwhelmed by it in a certain way but they're overwhelmed by it in the way that a devout believer is overwhelmed by the the feeling of the presence of god they they're just they're overwhelmed that that they should be touched by this and and that this wonderful experience is happening but at no point are like are, is there any sense of of disbelief um that any of it's legitimate or that um you know that 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 the order of the universe has somehow been upended. This is just a part of the fabric of the world as they understand it. And that really, I think, transfers onto the viewer and adds to that dreamlike state. Um, but but to to go back to this this question of confusion, like if I can give an example of a scene that I found confusing that I didn't understand why it needed to be confusing, that opening, yeah, yeah. that very opening scene. So we open on some livestock <laughs> standing around um, doing what livestock do, you know, there's some, there's a, there's a goat, there's, I think a mule, there's some geese. At one point the goat gets stroppy with the geese, head butts them. And they're just kind of standing, hanging around in the mud. And in the background, this is at, I think the credits are still playing at this point, if I'm not mistaken. I only saw it the one time. Yeah, but. I think so. Yeah. So in the background, there's this just visible above the walls of the city, there's a building on fire and the fire grows and grows and grows. And then at some point, this lord and his lady come through the gate, um, come through a doorway into where the livestock are standing and hitch up the mule. And the lord puts the lady on the mule and then he draws his sword and walks away. And so for me, this is opening on some kind of calamity. And my you know fantasy adventure brain is primed to think, you know, the city's under siege, uh, some some dramatic opening. And then instead, it pans to... Dev Patel sleeping in a brothel. And we never come back to what is going on there. Was the city attacked? What, what was this calamity that was occurring in the background? And I was so curious about that. I kind of obsessed about it later. Like, what was the point of this scene? Well, I yeah. think that's that's ultimately the, the problem I had with the movie is I, I, I felt that way about every scene. You know, it's, <laughs> I, I felt like like the director was basically taking an approach of, Ooh, ooh, I know it would be cool. Let's throw in a burning building. Oh, oh, let's throw in a dead saint. Oh, let's make a talking fox. And <laughs> all these things are just thrown in. And yeah, they are all cool. And and like in and of themselves, I loved watching it on the screen as it unfolded. And, and, and it was visually stunning and the atmosphere was great. And I think it, it might have succeeded more for me in the way that it su succeeded for Lara if if it was perhaps and I, I don't mean this to sound like you know the king telling mozart too many notes but it, <laughs> but it but it it needed to be shorter i i think it, when you're if you're going to have a movie that doesn't have a real narrative flow and doesn't have a real sort of character that you can latch onto then to have it not only be a 2 hour film but a very slowly paced 2 hour film where as you're going from scene to scene, and, and this is not a, a ding against Dev Patel. I love Dev Patel as an actor, and I think he did as phenomenal a job with this material as any actor could have. But he basically had one sort of one reaction. Face. <laughs> yeah, had one face throughout the whole film, and he that face was face. One, of, one of being dumbfounded. <laughs> yeah. Like, he was constantly dumbfounded. And that was the way he played every scene. He was just like, what? 
you know, like, and that, and, and so then you as the reader kind of feel the same way. You're like, yeah, dude, I don't know what is going on now either. And then you keep waiting for that answer and it never comes. And so I, I'm willing to go along with that for a while, but you know. But you could have replaced him with Ted Theodore Logan. <laughs> you could right, have, well, I guess. Yeah. Well, let me let me say, yeah. Even as I said, I liked this a lot more the second time, but I'm still left with the sense that the the middle part could have been shorter, and the part with the Lord and the Lady, you know, with um, Lord Bertilak, could have been a little longer and stuck a little bit closer to the poem, where it made a lot more sense to me. I'll say the thing at the beginning like legitimately makes absolutely no sense. I actually looked into that. And apparently if you look at the credits, those characters who are escaping from the burning city are identified as Helen of Troy in Paris. <laughs> and this is some sort of dream he's having about them. Oh, that's and... just a nod to the, to the fact that the poem opens with saying that England was founded by the refugees who fled the, the, the downfall of Troy. Cause that's like, the thing that's it, it's in Geoffrey of Monmouth. It's in all these things of like the sort of pseudo history of Britain that Brutus founded Britain uh, after he fled the fall of Troy. So that's just some sort of like symbolic nod. But again, if you don't know that, it's just super confusing. I, I, so I, 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 if that's what he was going for there, then again, it's just like, uh, come on, you, <laughs> you got to give me got to give me something to hang on to. All right, I want to get Lara back here too. Lara, any uh, anything else you want to say? Yeah, it's funny to me to hear people talk about how this movie felt like it was so long, because I didn't experience it as as dragging or think that the middle should be shorter. Uh, I, it it yeah, just I, felt I like it lasted the right amount of time. I, and if they had like kept going, and if he had had some other but, weird adventure, I would have been like, okay. <laughs> but I mean, it is a two hour and 15 minute long movie. I mean, it's objectively a long movie. It didn't feel it to me though. You know, like we went and saw, my partner and I went and saw Long Day's Journey into Night. I think like a year, a year or two ago. It must have been two years ago because obviously no one did anything last year. We went and saw Long Day's Journey into Night. Uh, with Jeremy Irons and Leslie Manville. And it was a like four and a half hour play. <laughs> it was really long. And at the end of it, when we walked out, I was like, I would have sat there for another four hours. I would I would have sat there. And and it's kind of one note. Like it's basically just you watch the dissolution of this family for four and a half hours. And everyone just gets successively crazier and more upset and things get worse and worse and worse. And then it, it gets as worse as it possibly could be. And then it's over. But the characters were so, like, watching everyone fall apart so beautifully. I was like, I could have watched them continue to fall apart for another four and a half hours. Uh, and the time did not feel like it took a long time in passing. And when I saw The Green Knight, I it didn't feel like it took a long time to happen. The two hours and 15 minutes did not feel like oh my god my back hurts i'm tired of sitting in this movie chair when, like mm -hmm. this movie could have been over half an hour ago it it felt like i was just suspended in a dream world for however long the movie was going to take well and i think that this is a movie where you're subjective where it's like a much more subjective movie than most movies and i mean most movies i just get a couple for the panels i just get a couple of people who are smart and interesting and i just let the chips fall where they may but i was like for this one i really want to make sure i get someone who loved this movie you know like someone who didn't like it you know like because i wanted both those perspectives because because they're you know among my friends you know it's people are like i love this i love this i love this i love this and people are like i hated this this is boring this is too long you know so yeah. um this isn't to me it's not a movie like um like hereditary or ex machina where if people are like should i go see this movie i would be like absolutely yes this is where I, this is a movie where if people are like should i go see this movie i would say how do you feel about pretentious movies <laughs> and if you like pretentious <laughs> movies absolutely go see it 100 percent. and if you hate pretentious movies and can't stand them like don't go see this you're not gonna like it at all yeah Although we even that yeah, go ahead. yeah, yeah, exactly. I was going to say that even that like, so, so the lighthouse is a super pretentious movie, mm. but I adored it. And I know a lot of people hate it. And it's funny, because Dave, you described this when I, I did that very yeah. thing. I, I was like, I asked Dave, I'm like, so should I see it? Is it worth seeing in the theater? Um, is it worth possibly catching COVID to watch this movie? And mm. he was like, it's a very polarizing movie. And, and when I had seen it, I thought that was kind of funny, because um, I didn't hate it. And I didn't love it. I, I liked it bordering on really liked it. Um, but 
I understand why it's polarizing, but I, I definitely didn't experience uh, an extreme reaction one way or the other. And I think part of that is because I, I kind of wish, I almost wish I wasn't a writer when I see these types of movies. And I wish I wasn't a writer with brutally honest agents because a huge part of my life is deconstructing why something works or doesn't work. And so as people who've heard me on the show before will know probably tiresomely well by this point, even if I love something, I'm going to nitpick it to death. This is just how it's just how I'm, I kind of am now programmed to experience stories and media. And that's a bit of a shame. And I, I kind of wonder how 20 years ago, me would have experienced this film differently. Um, but yeah, as it stands right now, I, I definitely really, I did enjoy it, but I can't help seeing what I consider to be areas for improvement. And let me just be clear, because I know I've been focusing on a lot of the negative. I, I do not consider myself to be someone who hated this movie either. I, I mean, like I said, there was there were definitely things that worked really well in here that we've talked about, the visuals and the atmosphere and all of that stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, it was a breathtaking movie to look at. So I loved all of that. Um, and there were certain things, there were certain, uh, even things that were added that were sort of original to to the director's vision that I thought were really great. I loved the the sort of monologue by the woman in the castle at the end about the color green. Like I could have listened to that for another five minutes. I, yeah, thought, yeah. I thought that was, was fascinating. Was really well written, yeah. And and there were a few other moments like that that I thought were beautiful and 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 really profound. I just think overall the balance of what worked and what didn't work, those scales for me lean more toward that that the movie just doesn't work overall. Um, let's, let's talk about the ending of the movie where, where, as I said, like all this stuff with Lord Bertilak, I thought they changed it too much from the poem and it didn't make a ton of sense to me. But, um, so what happens at the end is that we see Gawain kind of chicken out from getting his head chopped off and run back to Camelot and then he becomes king and then all this other stuff happens. And it's all this kind of like montage. Um, and I just, I thought that was so cool. And it, it turns out to be a sort of, um, occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge sort of thing where it turns out to be a vision of he's something he's either imagining or like a magical vision or something of, of what life would be like if he doesn't complete his quest, if he sort of chickens out. And then at the end, you know, he, he accepts his fate and he's ready. He takes off his, um, the green belt and he's ready to have his head chopped off. And I thought that was, I, was, I thought that was a perfect end to the movie. So um, regardless of all the other frustrations I had with it, uh, I, I ended up really, really liking the ending. And I thought that just the cinematography and everything of that whole ending sequence was just fantastic. So mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'd just be curious to hear what other, like, Chris, what did you think? Well, yeah. So I, I, I agree as, uh, as to how it was filmed, it was really, the cinematography was great. The, the, um, it was interesting that you, I don't think there was a single line of dialogue in that whole scene, which, which struck me as interesting too. And yet it, it still worked. Um, but, uh, I'm going to have to disagree with you strongly though. I actually think the ending was my least favorite part of the film. Um, because to me, the, the, the whole vision that he has of his future life is one of misery and disaster. And, you know, he, he ends up, you know, ha seeing the pain that he causes to the woman that he was sort of with at the beginning. Um, the, I guess she was the prostitute. Yeah. The, Essel. Yeah. Essel. Um, she, he eventually ends up, you know, his son dies in battle. Uh, he ends up losing the whole kingdom. It looks like they're about to be, you know, the, the enemies, whoever these enemies are, are about to break in and destroy the kingdom and, and, he, and Camelot has fallen. Um, and well, with that sort of a crap life, of course, like who wouldn't say, well, I might as well die now. I think it would have been way more of a big, in, powerful impact if he'd had a vision of a rosy life with all the trappings of success. But somehow you got the sense throughout all those scenes of, of perfection that there was always a kernel of shame eating away at him from having fled away from fulfilling his oath. So that in the end, he decides to sacrifice that rosy future just to regain his honor or, or whatever. Um, and I think because it wasn't really sort of a real choice like that, it was like, ah, well, I guess I don't I won't have that life of misery. Then it, it almost seemed like the choice didn't matter. It was just sort of like, well, how is that something 
worthy. Yeah, I actually really I love that actually, Chris. Like this idea that yeah, if you don't have honor, anything else you get, you know, family or kingdom, fame, riches, etc., is meaningless. Yeah. You know, I, I almost I, I almost think that's what he was trying to do. Like again, when we're projecting intent, so who knows? Um, and I do agree with, with Lara that like you you should take it on its own terms and try to measure it against its own intent. So it's hard to know for sure. But I actually think that's what they were trying to suggest, that he gets what he thinks he wants, um, but that over time it gets progressively worse and worse because this is the inevitable fate of a life lived without honor, except that I don't think it it was necessarily as successful in portraying that as as perhaps it could have been with the result that like, this is, again, an area where maybe ambiguity is not your friend. I think it's sort of like less about honor in an abstract to me it's sort of like if you're the kind of person who would wear the green girdle that will protect you from harm then you're the kind of person that leads this life so it's it wouldn't quite work if it was like you wore the green girdle and you had an amazing life but you're always ashamed of yourself secretly it's like the kind of person who wears who wears the green girdle and and goes without honor lives this kind of life and then shows all of the misery and it it's like do you want to be that person or do you want to find out what the other kind of person is and like maybe the other kind of person dies right now right here or maybe the other kind of person lives some kind of life that you'll find out after reaping the rewards of your honor right now Although, of course, in the film, the, the knight then does the final line is off with your head. So it leaves the impression he's going to be killed. <laughs> yeah, but then it's like, it, I mean, if you're the kind of person who will let your head chopped off rather than be the kind of person right. who causes all this harm, then that is more honorable. Um, but I do think there is a line of dialogue in that in that scene. And it's it's Gowan saying, is, I think he says, is that all there is? Um, and to your point, Chris, earlier of saying that he had this sort of like one note performance of just being dumbfounded, I had this sudden realization that like, yeah, he is just dumbfounded. He's wandering around in the world being like, oh my God, all this stuff is happening. And he gets to the end of his quest, still not understanding any of it. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't want to die without without understanding why all this stuff happened to him, right? So he's like, is that all there is? Do I not get to any of the answers? Do I not get any resolution? And and he has to decide whether whether he wants to die not knowing um, with his so, honor intact. So you're or saying not. this movie is a whole like meta commentary on audiences I was not just needing answers. That. It's like <laughs> Whoa. the audience going, is that all there is? And the director <laughs> saying, what else should there be? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. Well, I, actually, I, I really like that too, um, Lara. That interpretation. But go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I actually do as well. I was going to say, I, I think that's that's about the best interpretation of that final scene that I could think of, and so I totally agree with that. I just, I wonder why, though. And again, we, you know, there's really no way to know this, but I mean, he definitely, like Lowry, the director, chose to go in this direction. As I mean, because like in the, it, it, you know, in the poem. It's not that he kept the uh, the belt on that makes him dishonorable. Even the knight says to him afterwards, he says, oh, that's OK. I mean, who cares? Like, obviously, you didn't want to die. I mean, that's understandable. That doesn't make you dishonorable. You, you should have told me about it. It was the fact that he lied that made him dishonorable. But, you know, so he, he's sort of in the poem, he's able to kind of have his cake and eat it like he 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 resigns himself to the fact that he made this oath. He's got to take the blow. And he takes the blow, but in the end, that you know, it's only that little nick to the back of his neck for for having told the lie. And then he goes home and he tells that you know everyone celebrates him for being this great knight who who upheld his honor. And he says to them all, "Yeah, but I didn't really because I flinched first from the first blow, and I didn't tell him about this magical belt." And they're all just like, "Oh, come on, dude, you're <laughs> an honorable knight." And in fact. That you know what? We're if you're going to keep wearing that. Oh, oh, he says. So I'm always going to wear this belt now for the rest of my life to remind me of my dishonor. And they say that's not dishonor. That's just being human. 
And we're all, as the Knights of the Night Roundtable, going to wear a belt now and make that be our symbol, both to remind us of your nobility and all of our own sort of inherent human failings that, that you know, lest we all get to, you know, our heads too big for ourselves. Um, I, I like that. And I like the whole, in, the, in that vision scene, the, the girdle has physically wormed into his gut, into his abdomen. And he actually has to extract it. He pulls it out painfully out of out of his gut. And I thought that was a really interesting choice and, and a clever one because it kind of it speaks to the fact that he's internalized this inability to take risk. He's internalized this inability to um to lead the honorable life or or make the right choices. Um and in, and until he sort of you know pulls that out of, of his gut, until he he rejects that way of living, it's never going to be any different. And I just thought that was a really sort of visceral way of of hammering that point home. Mm. Oh, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that it was in him. I definitely read the I, scene I where he removes either. it as an, as like a metaphor for him pulling his own guts out. Cause that's what it looks like. But I didn't even think what I thought of in that scene is actually the, the girl with the green ribbon. Cause he unties it and his head, falls mm. off and i was like oh this is mm. this is the the creepy ghost story that you tell around <laughs> around the campfire the girl with the green ribbon don't untie it or her head will fall off <laughs> i don't know what that means thematically but that's what i thought of <laughs> does does anyone have any uh thoughts on the fact that essel the prostitute and lord Bertilak's wife were both played by the, the same, same actors? actor i thought what? i didn't yeah. even know so that was one of three things that I was going to bring up as like really interesting choices. The first one is the belt in the guts and and watch it again. We should all watch it again. Like, but I'm pretty sure that's what I saw. No, definitely. The, yeah, for sure. The second was, was the fact that the, that the girlfriend and the, and the wife were played by the same actress. And the third was that, it, it, that Sean Harris was playing the voice of the Fox. So it's King Arthur who's speaking to him through the Fox, I think, uh, which I didn't understand. That was a head scratcher for me. So yeah, I mean, I don't, well, I don't have an answer for you on that second well, question, Dave. Okay. Well, let me. Well, bef I'll, I'll address the King Arthur. Th I mean, because I, I, it seemed to me that King Arthur and uh, Morgan Le Fay are kind of in the, in on this together, because King Arthur says to Gawain, "This is just a. Don't worry, it's all just a game." Um, and then there's like various. There, I don't know. I don't know if we don't have time to get into everything, but there's all this stuff about how they like CGI'd King Arthur's face and the faces of pretty much everyone onto the Green Knight at the end in the Green Chap when he's like sitting, when he's like kneeling there all night. Um, and then when the fox talks, to, the fox is like trying to get him to not get in the boat. And the, uh, I have the quote here somewhere, but he, he says basically like, come home, you mm -hmm. know, just c come home now or something so obviously the fox is like someone is either his mother or king arthur or or something like someone from camelot who wants him to come home um so so that that kind of fits with with the fox being voiced by um by the same actor as king arthur right um but yeah 100 percent alicia vikander plays plays both of those characters um essel and, and and the lady so and so so um larry you you, you didn't even notice that I didn't even notice. I cannot believe I didn't notice. And now I'm like, wow, what, sh what should I, what should I get from that? So for me, the tip off, like that was, uh, I, I did not remember all that much about the poem. And for me, when I saw her, that was the tip off that I, I remembered. I was like, oh yeah, um, the, the green knight is, is the Lord. And then, so I kind of thought that she, I mean, to the extent that she's set up as part of his test of knightly honor, they deliberately make it look like the woman he maybe sort of loves and has been dishonorable to as a sort of way to sort of um, make the test even more difficult that, you know, this is a familiar face and it's somebody he's already um, been intimate with. And so it'll be just that much easier for him. Like he'll want her even more and it'll be that much easier for him to capitulate. So it just makes the test of his honor yeah. a little bit harder. Well, and it's, I mean, a lot of this is interpretation, so I don't know, but I mean, it seems that like maybe he loves her, but they can never be together because he's the heir to the throne and she's a prostitute. Whereas if she comes in and it's exactly her, but she's now a, a noble lady, then this is more of a temptation for him because it's the, the one thing that's keeping them apart has been removed from the equation. Mm. Though I think the implication of the of the vision at the end is that they could be together if he's 
the right kind of honorable, right? That only if he is truly dishonorable will he use her and cast her aside, mm-hmm. which is, you know, only possible in a fairy tale for, for him to be with his true love, the prostitute. <laughs> uh, probably not possible in real life. But in Arthurian legend, like if you're truly an honorable man, like you would not dishonor a woman like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's also interesting that they chose to have him fail that test of his honor uh, in the in the film at the end with the woman on the third day, uh, as opposed to in the, the poem where he, you know, he resists her advances. He kind of goes halfies on that. Well. What <laughs> <laughs> uh, Because well, well, this is really, it's like a, um, like an inversion of the poem in a way where, you know, in in the poem, Gawain like, like basically is always heroic, and except at the very end, he kind of like mm-hmm. has this failing. And in the, in this, he's always screwing up. Right. And then at the very end, he like has a bit of a triumph. So it, it's almost like yeah, it's almost like a parody or a like a mirror image or something of the original of the sort of the point of the original. It's definitely poem. challenging the, the sort of uh, deliberately, I think, subverting the the tropes of the uh, you know the chivalric code and the sort of chivalric romance. I did read his failure in that seduction scene as almost the same craving not to die as as the craving that keeps him from removing the the green girdle in the poem. Right. Because she's offering it to him and he says, "I, I want it. Right. Like, I do want it. And we're like, "Okay, does he mean that he wants the sex or does he mean that he doesn't want to die? Because she's holding the girdle right in front of him. And he's like, I do. She's like, tell me that you want it. And he says, I do. That's not and you're like, yeah, holding. you do. We don't want you to die. <laughs> I guess, I see, but I guess what this raises for me, I, I keep coming back to this is, so I think it's really cool to re-explore these themes and to, to subvert, you know, turn him from a virtuous knight into the exact opposite. But again, I'm then left with the question, yeah, but but to what end? Like, what are we to take from this? Like, what has he shown us in the movie by doing that, that would that we wouldn't have gotten had he not subverted that trope? I, I guess that's where I'm always left a little scratching my head with with all of these choices. They just seem to be somewhat arbitrary. Or if there was a, a method to the madness, I, it's it's just over my head, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I'm just not. Well, well, I, I, I did. Like I said, I liked the ending. And, and even as a kid reading the, the book and everything, it always really bugs me that that Gawain makes this choice to put on the belt and then basically doesn't, isn't punished for, you know, or like everyone's like, like you said at the end, everyone's like, Oh, that you're still cool. We still, you know, you're still our bud, everything. And I mean, like, I, I liked that this makes that. And cause that's, that's to me is, is almost like the key choice of the poem is like, do you, do you try to cheat death by putting on this magic belt, which kind of, you know, kind of like ruins the whole test of your courage and so I, I liked that this interpretation made that much more central and made much more of like, yeah, this is like just cheating. You know, you can't do that. Like, that's not cool. You know, I mean, I, I thought that that was I really I really liked that. I thought that was really interesting to thing to focus on. It makes me wonder if in the original poem, if he had taken off the green girdle, would the knight have just killed him? Right. Because mm-hmm. the knight is like, it's OK that you left that on. Right. We all know. No one wants to die. It's fine. If he hadn't kept it, what would have happened? Well, I, I it, you know, it's funny. I, I almost started to wonder after thinking about this more, you know, in the past week than I've thought about it ever before. If the if the green belt was just a magic feather that actually had no power, because even in the poem, he's wearing the belt, and yet the knight was still able to cut his skin with the sword. No. In, in the version I read. Like it was one hundred percent clear that the green belt had was was a fake, and the and the knight says if you hadn't put it on or if you hadn't lied to me about it, I wouldn't have cut you at all. Like this whole thing was a test of your courage, but I didn't. Mm. I never wanted to kill you, right? Um, and so if you, but it like so to the extent that I harmed you at all, it was because of your of your slight failing. But he makes it clear that he wouldn't have harmed him at all if Gawain had been uh, honorable Honest through the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, so the, the green knight... the green belt is just like a. A, not a MacGuffin, but like a, I don't know, a, a prop. Well, yeah, in like, the original, placebo. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My placebo magical. But I, I feel like in this, like, because his mother gives it to him to protect him, I feel like it's not a fake in this. But yeah, not, but in the original poem, it's very like. Yeah, yeah. It it just exists to create an opportunity. I also think it. it I, I I certainly was feeling some sort of incestuous vibes too in that seduction scene where I think we're supposed to assume the mother is basically inhabiting the, the woman who's seducing him because how else, I mean, that's the only way I come up with that. She, she basically has the same exact belt that she gives him. Yeah. Well, I think the mother is like a lot of, a lots of characters. Like I think yeah, she's, yeah. she's definitely the lady. She's definitely the blind old woman. Right. She's definitely the green knight to some extent. Uh, she might be the fox. She might be the scavenger. I didn't notice this at all until people pointed it out. But um, when, you know, the scavenger who robs him and mm -hmm. is about to behead him with, with the Green Knight's axe, the scavenger, like, stops at the last minute and says, like, uh, don't worry, little knight, I'll finish your quest for you, and then gets on his horse and rides off, sparing his life. And, like, why does he call him little knight? That sounds like... Some, like 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 various people throughout the movie call him Brave Knight or a little Brave Knight or something like that. And I think that I didn't go back. I'd have to go back and watch it again to check this. But I think we're, we're meant to understand that those are his mother speaking in all those through the mouths of all those characters. Um, all right, cool. But so we're uh, running a little short on time. So I guess I'll just mention there was like a, there's like so many things in this movie. Like we could probably talk about this for like another hour just going through all the weird stuff that maybe makes no sense. Like one thing I wanted to mention is I don't know if anyone noticed this when, uh, when Gawain arrives at the castle of Lord Bertilak and Lord Bertilak is standing at the top of the stair. He's a says, bear. He's like, he's a in a bear, bear costume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't notice that at all. Yeah. It's so weird. <laughs> um, and then also, I don't know if everyone knows there was a post credit scene in this movie. Yep. Yeah. Didn't understand why. Yeah. So, so basically you see a little girl playing with, king arthur's uh crown um i don't know i mean some people are saying like oh obviously that means that the green knight spared gawain because he must have come back to camelot and had a daughter and stuff i i, I guess that could be true i don't i don't know i think what i got from that is because his child his first child at least in the vision that he has as a son um that when we see that it's like yes the green knight spared his life and he is not living that he's not wearing the crown and there's this little girl. And so it's like, okay, he's not living the life that was threatened in that oh, vision. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay. So we know that his life has turned out differently because, uh, because of the cause choice. He didn't cut did, because he didn't chicken out. Yeah. Um, did we talk about this already that, um, in the movie, it does not seem like Lord Bertilak and the green knight are supposed to be the same person. It's, it's definitely never. It's not stated. the same actor even. And and so like they could have easily done it so that it's the same actor because he would have been so heavily covered in his Ent makeup mm. that he would have been pretty much unrecognizable anyway. Um, and it, his voice is also adulterated enough that you could have easily cast the same actor. And I think, that, you know, if because they cast Sean Harris as the fox. Um, you know, I think we're, we're meant to understand that, that there's a, that there's a magical relationship there. The fact that they didn't do that with the green knight is, is interesting. And I, I just wondered like, why, why make that choice? But. Well, maybe I should, I, like, I mentioned this, but maybe I should, should have explained it more, but yeah, like, so in the scene where there's the green, where Gawain goes to the green chapel and the green knight is sort of like enmeshed in the vines and stuff and it's dark, there's like a part where you see the green knight's face sort of morph. And like most of mo the most clear image that come, and I didn't even really notice this watching it in the theater, but the most clear image that comes through is Lord Bertilak. But then you also see it morph into like King Arthur and a couple other characters, and then finally Gawain himself. Yeah. So I, I think this movie is it's it's not just like oh he's really Lord Bertilak, but he's yeah. like I don't know it's it's more like. Like everything in the movie, it's more ambiguous. Yeah, and I took that in that scene that that um, Gowan is sort of projecting his own. Like these are all the people I'm trying to live up to, and the people I'm trying to please, and the and the people whose respect that I want. Um, and the Green Knight is sort of he's projecting the, those faces onto it because a lot of this a lot of this whole movie just feels like you're watching Gowan on a huge mushroom trip. Yeah. <laughs> Um, like, like that scene where they do the, the 360, you know, so he's captured by the bandits and he's trussed up 
and he's left for dead in the forest. And there's this slow 360 degree turn and the color palette changes, which possibly suggests like that a, a year has gone by and the seasons have changed, but whatever, by the time we complete the 360, he's just a skeleton, but he's a skeleton that hasn't moved an inch. Like he hasn't tried at all to escape his predicament. Um, and so that was another scene. And anyway, as you said, Dave, we could do this all day. Um, where you kind of start projecting. And I like that one. I like sort of playing with that scene and projecting the interpretations of, of what we're looking at and, and why this scene exists. Um, and my own sort of take on it is he's kind of considering surrendering himself to his fate, um, but then ultimately decides not to do that. Yeah, I like that too. And it also, I thought it was important to set up the the sort of fake out at the ends where, you know, this whole scenario reels out and then we see that it was just a dream or a fantasy or something. I think you, you needed some, some other examples of that before that to kind of set that up. Mm. Um, all right, but we are, yeah, we're pretty much out of time. So why don't we uh, start getting some final thoughts here? So Lara, any final thoughts on the green Knight? Oh man. <laughs> um, I want to watch it again after having this conversation because I also have only seen it once. Um, and I didn't even notice the the morphing of the face um, of the Green Knight. So that makes me feel like there are probably a lot of things that if I go back, I'll be like, wow. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I think that it was a movie that I didn't feel like I needed to investigate a lot because it felt like, like I didn't need to pick it apart at a story level because it felt like a movie that that was not the important thing about it the narrative was not the important thing about it. The everything else was the important thing about it. Yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, just listening to the filmmakers talk, they talk a lot about the visuals and the, like Chris was saying, the Easter eggs and stuff. And so, yeah, I, I, I and like Aaron was saying, I, I think it is definitely a movie where sort of the symbolism and the, the look of it got, got, was more of the focus than the necessarily the, the narrative. Yeah, and you know, know what it reminds me of? I know we're supposed to do final words, and I'm like, oh, yeah. there's actually something about this that I'm going to tack on. Um, Holly Black was one of my clarion instructors, and when she was talking to us about magic systems in fantasy, she said there are two kinds. There's day logic and night logic. And day logic is the kind that you can explain with rules. Like in Harry Potter, if you say these words and you move your wand like this, then you get this effect. And that night logic is things that just feel right and you can't poke too hard at it and it's harder to write because you have to conjure the feeling of rightness without the explicit rules and so to me a lot of this movie felt like very night logic like you can't push too hard on this it's just something that works because it feels right and i i really appreciated that and i think that that's why it might not stand up to to so much probing is that it you just have to accept that this is happening because this is the kind of thing that happens in this kind of story. Yeah. Chris, final thoughts. Well, I'm going to partially uh, cheat here and use uh, as my final thoughts, someone else's final thoughts. Cause I actually noticed today on uh, Facebook, the author, Jeff Vandermeer said something about this movie that I found interesting. Um, uh, he comes right out and says in his post, he hated this movie. Um, and he said that it was, it gave, it felt like, uh, watching this movie was like meeting someone who's wearing their internal organs on the outside of their body. <laughs> um, and I think what he goes on to explain that, and I think what he's saying there is, is that all of the sort of symbolism and metaphor and all the rest of that is so in your face that it sort of gets in the way, you know, it's interesting for a moment or two when you kind of rubberneck and look at it and think like, whoa, this is like nothing I've ever seen before. But then ultimately, it just sort of gets in the way of getting to know and understand the person or the film behind all of that. And and I think that's kind of the way that I felt about it in the end. Um, this is definitely not a movie that like, you know, I came out of saying, oh, I wish I could get those two hours of my life back because I, I didn't feel that way. I, I, I'm glad I watched this. And there are definitely elements of this that will stay with me. Um, really powerful visual scenes that that will haunt me um, having seen them. And, and and I think they were phenomenally well done. But ultimately, that's about all I will remember about this movie is those visuals and everything else is just sort of already fading from my memory. 
I guess like, let me just mention one other thing is I, I forgot to mention is that there's this video on YouTube. Uh, I didn't write down the title of it, but but there's this whole thing in the poem. It makes clear that there are these five knightly virtues, and that's the reason that the knights wear a pentacle is the, you know, the five points um, symbolize these five virtues. And Guinevere in the movie, she gives a speech where she says, hmm. uh, may the blessed virgin keep your five fingers strong, your five senses sharp. May her five joys inspire you. The five wounds of her son give you fervor. The five virtues of the night light your way. So there's this um, allusion to it, but they never say what the five virtues are. And so throughout the movie, you see him failing in these, to live up to these five virtues. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's like, again, it's like you would have to, go outside the movie you'd have to import information from outside the movie for this to mean anything to you um and and so yeah it's it's just whether you like that sort of you know whether you like going outside the text for in, for for sort of vital information to interpret it is is sort of i think your audio response to this movie is going to depend on um but so aaron final thoughts um for me overall i think this movie was very successful at what it set out to do. Um, and I think the fact that critics by and large were falling all over themselves to praise this movie suggests that there aren't enough films out there trying to do this. And I think, mm. I, and I, I would agree with that. I think it was really swinging for the fences with a particular type of thing that is not going to appeal to everybody. And so I think despite the fact that it was imperfect, um, people who were sort of disposed to take it on its own terms um, will probably, or who just generally have um, an affinity for the atmospheric and the ethereal are going to appreciate it more than those who are looking for sort of the cold, clear logic. Um, so yeah, like I said, I I think it was, I would give it sort of three and a half stars out of five. And my main thing is I just wish I wish I could have attached to the protagonist more. But with those caveats, I I would like to see more of this. I would like to see more fantasy that really swings for the fences and doesn't regurgitate the same old stuff over and over. Yeah. And I mean, it's not like there's so many great medieval fantasy movies that you can be super picky. I mean, like, so yeah, this one is definitely, you know, too pretentious for me, but it's like compared to so many movies that have no artistic ambition whatsoever. Uh, you know, I feel like I can't like spurn this one too much just because you know i love med medieval fantasy so much and you know yeah like anything that has any sort of artistic seriousness is, is sort of becomes a must watch in this this landscape when uh yeah it's not like sci-fi that way there's a lot more sci-fi that really that really tries to be challenging i think than what we've been given in terms of fantasy in on the screen that, that there's not a lot that's deliberately trying to be challenging and provocative. And I, and I think this movie does that and is largely successful in doing so. Yeah. So, so, so that's kind of my final, my final take on it is that, yeah, when I first saw it, I was really exasperated with it and I, I didn't, wasn't planning to talk about it, but just, you know, it's, it stuck with me. And the more I thought about it, the more kind of interested in it I became. So, um, you know, if that appeals to you, uh, you know, give it a look. Uh, I mean, there's certainly a lot of cool stuff in it. Um, but we don't have time to go into any more of it right now, so we're going to have to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Aaron Lindsay, Christopher M. Savasco, and Lara Elena Donnelly. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Aaron Lindsay, Christopher M. Savasco, and Lara Elena Donnelly for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.